to mostly review questions today, not so thought-provoking as they sometimes are. <laughs> I think so. I know Marty's preaching tonight. Do you I know do. it's not you? Oh, yeah, I do. Know that. I preached last Sunday, so y'all wouldn't do that two weeks ago. <laughs> I'm in good shape. Reassured. All right, so we're going to start in a minute with these review questions. You think these are hard? Just be next door where they're taking Marty's review questions. <laughs> that would get you working on being prepared. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have, I tried to go down and make some extra copies of this morning's lesson. The copier acted like it was working, but then would just say, I'm busy. I don't even know what that means. Usually it's like paper jams and problems. This one was just like a really calm message that said, I'm busy. <laughs> and it wouldn't, wouldn't do anything. Go away. <laughs> that was way beyond my ability to argue with. Um, so a lot of other folks will come in next minute. But since we're reviewing, let's just go ahead and get started. And then these aren't kind of thought-provoking about this class. It's more about what we've been doing. So what, in your words, what would you say is the outward purpose of the church? Yeah, would you say evangelism? What, what do we really mean by that? When we use the, that, that word, what do we mean by evangelism? What do you think? Okay. Spreading the gospel. Yeah, and... and <clears throat> So think in contrast for a moment, maybe go back and think about the first purpose of the church that we've talked about, the inward purpose. So here we have this focus on members. And the church is made up of people. We've stressed that several times. But ideally, at least the way that it's presented in Scripture, who are those people? What do they have in common? Church. 
church members, what do they actually have in common? They're saints. They're saints. They're saved. I mean, it, there's so many different ways in which they are addressed at the beginning of letters and all. When he's talking to the churches, it's always true that the intention is <clears throat> they're, they're saved people. They have a relationship in Christ. Evangelism, this outward purpose, is about the church trying to have an effect on those that don't have a relationship with Christ. How do we influence the world? How do we teach the world? And there is an outward purpose that God has in, in mind uh, regarding that. <clears throat> I'll come back in a, in a moment and talk a little bit about how the two things relate, the inward and the outward. What are two models, though, of supporting evangelists? So one way that the church might do this outward uh, mission, purpose that God has in mind, is to have a relationship with evangelists, who are those who are out spreading the word, spreading the message. Remember, what's the word that's inside of evangelists? Angel. Angel, Angel which is, really means a messenger. And so they are out teaching and others. And one way the church can do it is to have a relationship with them. But we said there were two models. At least we kind of tried to dig through the scriptures and think about two different ways of supporting them. What, what are the two models? We use churches to describe the models or to, to title them, let's say. Philippi, Philippi was one. So we said there's a Philippian model. We'll come back to it in a moment. So that's one. What's the other one? Antioch. Antioch. So here are two churches that, that both supported men to go out and preach the gospel, but there were some subtle differences between them. In both cases, we can think about their relationship with Paul. Do you look, think back to the book of Acts. In Acts 16, Paul comes into Philippi. He, he uh, teaches, uh, is it Lydia that's there? And then uh, the Philippian jailer and his family are converted. But really, how long does Paul stay in Philippi? Uh, maybe weeks. I mean, it's, it's a short period of time. He gets run out of town, and there's no other place where we kind of see him coming back. He may have come back, but he didn't settle down and really work with the Philippians. And yet, years later, decades later, and when he writes the Philippian letter, what does he say about them and their relationship with him over all of that period of time? From the first day, they supported him. They had supported him, provided for his needs from the very first. Even down in Thessalonica, which, by the way, is the next place he went after Philippi. So here is a picture of a church having a relationship with a man teaching the gospel who's not with them. And yet, over the years, even when he went to other places, they were constantly looking for opportunities when they could support him and help him. Is that true of this church? Do we have relationships like that? with men that are not here and perhaps have never been here, but this church has a relationship with them in terms of their teaching the gospel. You're, you're saying yes. Hey. Yes. So so where? Give me an example of one of those. That new. guy in Mexico. Ah, I love, love that. <laughs> that guy. Here's our relationship <laughs> with this man. You and Olin have known yes. you and that. I've, I've never met him. His I've name is Arturo. Okay, okay. You've never met him, but you never watched. That's right. And that is an interesting thing that we haven't met him. By the way, he is the brother of Delila Stringer, which is one way in which we had some relationship and knowledge of him. But you're right. Uh, we don't have quite the same as some of these other men. And that's a challenge because that's one thing we want to have is a deeper, richer relationship with these men. Thanks for letting me tease you there. Me all this time. Um, so that's one. Give me another one. Someone else like that, Philippian kind of model, at least one more. Glenn Jones. Glenn Jones is in Germany, and this church uh, has been supporting him since the 70s, I, I believe. And he has come uh, occasionally, but still, we don't see him that often. It's more of that Philippian kind of model. Um, what else? Uh, oh, so Antioch. Give me, give me an Antioch model. So what, what was it like, first of all? In the Bible. So Paul and Antioch. What's different about his relationship with them than the relationship he had with Philippians? He stayed there for a while and always came back. Okay. So he spent a considerable time period with them, then he left, and he came back. The, the, the main thing I want you to kind of keep in mind is that there were times when Paul was working right there in Antioch. They supported him. 
Do you feel like that Paul was only teaching Christians when he was doing that, kind of fulfilling this inward purpose of the church? Can you imagine Paul only teaching those who are already converted? That day? I just can't even see that. And, and I think when he's in Ephesus, similar situation, Paul is for three years in Ephesus, he seems to indicate in some of his right that, that there was teaching in the gospel being spread beyond Ephesus as a part of his work. So I think he was doing both. And in the case of Antioch, they sent him off on a mission, he came back. Is that true of this church? Do we have some that we support in more of that kind of model, this Antiochian model? Ben Hall? Yeah, so it, Ben it fits that in a couple of ways. Maybe a little bit better when he was actually here, right? Do we ever send Ben off somewhere else while he was an evangelist here? Where's the place he went? Anybody remember? Sierra Leone was one. Uh, and there are other. And I think even the fact that sometimes somebody would uh, invite him to a gospel meeting in San Diego or uh, you know some other place, the fact that we allowed him, wanted him to go and do that, that's a little bit of the same sort of model. That was certainly true of Sewell over, over the years as well. Uh, so there are a lot of different ways in which we've done it. Those are a couple of models of supporting Another thought, though, too, besides the fact that a church can be involved in supporting a person who is out all the time, kind of their life focus on teaching those that are, are lost or building those up in certain places where they are that, that have been converted, that's a great way of supporting. That's part of that outward purpose. But we also wanted to just stress the work that each one of us should be doing. And we ought to be out teaching others as well. So how does the church help prepare each of us to be lights to the world? Through the sermons? Okay. And Bible in, classes. In what way do the sermons and Bible classes help prepare us? Because I think when we've talked about this, hasn't that been part of our inward purpose? You know, we can edify, build one another up. We've got these sermons. We've got classes. We're, we're learning the Word. That's, that sounds more like that's the inward purpose. Yeah, I think Chester's on to something here, but it does sound like the inward purpose, doesn't it? So how is it preparing us for the outward purpose of the church? Well, I mean, all of these purposes build upon and support one another, so it's almost like you kind of go around with a smile. So yeah. Or built up inwardly, you reach out outwardly, you become aware of the need to for the upward purpose, and then it just, like, keeps I like that. Around. Yeah, maybe should we at some point kind of explore that imagery of the, of the spiral as we're doing it because we come back around to some of these things again. I hope this morning when we begin to talk about the um, upward purpose that you will see how deeply connected it is to both of these, to a message to the world and also what's happening from within, what ought to be the case of us as, as, as a group here. So that's important. Yeah, so the edification in things is true. I'm going to come back to this question in a minute because I you know, we, we started here because this was a review. It's actually this slide I'm supposed to come back to later because there were a couple other things I wanted to show you. Um, there's the title of the class. I'm going to hike it all the way over to the far right. It's really bugging me, but it doesn't matter. Hmm. And then we're up to the content. And I want you to notice I did finally put a name. Jason, you'll be glad about this. I put titles here. So it's not oh, part yeah. one and two. Jason wondered about that. It was inconsistent. Yeah, it was inconsistent. At some point, I changed the inward purpose from part one, two, and three, the titles, and I still have part one and two in worship. I was thinking a little bit more about what these, <clears throat> the classes themselves are about. This one is about declaring God's glory. We will look at worship, at least one aspect of worship this morning, to get to it, and then we'll look at other aspects uh, in acts of worship in our very final lesson on Wednesday. Uh, but I think you'll see that this lesson is an upward purpose about declaring something about God. The church makes a statement about God and declares his glory. We do that in worship, but there's some other ways in which we do it as well that the scriptures will tell us, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And then here are our goals. And everything uh, we've been stressing the last few lessons, goals three and four, being more determined to please God in everything that we do. But you see here on this fourth one, where we said we want to be a more active, faithful member uh, of the church. In this case, of course, in these two lessons, being that kind of a member in regard to our worship and other aspects of this upward uh, purpose, if you will. 
serving God. So back to these questions again. How does the church help e prepare each of us to be lights to the world? There's one other way in, but besides building up our knowledge, understanding about God, edifying us. Um, well, before I show this next slide, would you also agree that there, there's an important role in terms of our relationships in the ability to, to tell others about Christ? How would you connect the relationships that we're building here uh, as far as they may have an effect on our teaching others about Christ? We have yeah, reputations. See. We have uh, the way we're perceived by others and known by others. Okay. Is, is both inside the church and outside the church. Yes, the, uh, something about the way that we... Uh, what our relationships say to the world. And then we're going to come back and show some of that in a moment. I think that's important. I think another, that's, I have something else in mind, but go ahead, Steve. I'll say, uh, you know, I feel all my Paul did. Yeah. I was kind of looking for a little bit of that, too. Um, the point Steve's making is, is kind of the heart of a lot of what we'll talk about later on in this lesson in particular. But I think it's the encouragement. Um, telling people about Christ you maybe don't, believe in God or don't believe in Him, it's, that can be a discouraging, uh, difficult thing. And, and people who have no interest in, in your moral standards and don't understand and aren't willing to talk about, well, what is it that God, what really just pleases God, those kinds of things can be discouraging. And the relationships we build in, strengthen us and, and make it more, uh, it, it makes it easier to be able to continue to try to do those things. There's another way, though, in which I think that the church helps us, and it's to do things like this. Uh, we did this back in the sp spring. I'm sure we'll do something like this again, where there were uh, men here who helped put together some teaching programs, found those that would host these studies in their homes, gave us material, helped to put this together. This is the communication flyers, if you remember, and they were here, available for us to pass out to neighbors or to be able to electronically send out uh, notices and neighborhood uh, email groups and things, different ways that we could communicate it. And they went beyond that. They even helped prepare some material. I think this is all a part of that, <coughs> equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. So this was uh, those that are part of this church helping prepare the rest of us, equip us to make it easier for us to do what might be pretty difficult at times, which is to tell others about Christ. I think that's a part of the, the church's role as well, that we're engaged and involved in things like that. Okay. I'm going to skip on ahead. We talked about some of the things that some others do here. Let's begin to talk about this upward purpose. I want to establish for you this morning, I think there's two ways we can think about the upward purpose. The, the, the God, remember, this is God's plan. Christ said, I'm going to build my church. All right. What do you have in mind? What, what do you want that church to do? Why, why are you building a church? Well, the first thing we'll say this morning as far as upward purposes is that we are meant to glorify God by who we are. The fact that there even is a church, what it's like is intended to glorify God. And we'll, we'll look at some passages about that. But the second thing is that sometimes we, are, we come together like we are this morning to worship and honor God. And there are acts and things that we engage in that have been intended for us to be able to honor God and glorify Him by our acts. So, again, both of them focus on the idea of glorifying God, but one is just who we are. What does this church statement about God? And the second one is the actual acts we come together. Open your Bibles up to Ephesians chapter 1, if you would. We'll start there and try to work our way through some things here. Um, Ephesians 1 has a number of statements in the beginning part. Of course, the whole initial statement in Ephesians 1 is about all the blessings that a follower of Christ has in the body. What? All these blessings that God has provided through Christ. But you'll notice here, look at verse 6. Let's just kind of read the whole thing here, Ephesians 1. 
Um, maybe go back up to verse 5 where it says he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Why did God do these things for us? Why has he worked so hard to save us? Ephesians 1 verse 6 says part of it is that it would be to the praise of his glorious grace. God has done these things so that he would receive praise. You understand that? So look at verse 12. Same kind of thought here in verse 12. We're talking about all of our blessings, but part of that says, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. We stand forth as something that would praise God. Praise His glory, if you, if you will. Now, at this stage, you ought to be asking, yeah, but how does that happen? I mean, it's one thing to say that we're going to, just by our existence, be a statement of praise to God, but I, I, I need a little more specifics. We'll come to that in a moment. I want you to look down at verses 18 and 19. And in, in this case, and by the way, I, I, I'm apologizing if you're visiting. I don't have extra material. I really meant for to, to grab a couple extra sheets this morning. Don't have it. But those of you who have your material, you can go ahead and open it to page 39. Because what we're trying to do is kind of walk through some of these things in Ephesians in a moment. I'm going to ask you some questions and ask you to cover up page 39 because I don't want you cheating on this. You really... <laughs> know these things. But we're talking through some things at the beginning part of this about glorifying God. So look at verses 18 and 19 here in Ephesians 1. I want you to notice, if you go back up to verse 16, this is part of a prayer. So what we're, we're about to read here is part of Paul praying on behalf of the uh, of Ephesians. And he leads up to this thought here. And Michael, if you don't mind, read for us verses 18 and 19. Having the eyes of your heart uh, enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his uh, glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the work of his great might. All right. One of the things I want you to notice out of this, first of all, this phrase, the, the idea of the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. I'm not sure this is exactly right, but this is what some have said about that. It's what that's saying is, is that God is going to receive something from the existence of the saints. Having done this work, having created saved people, God then receives something from us. And, and already verses 6 and 12 would say that he's getting praise as a result of our existence. I'm not exactly sure I, I agree with that. I, I, I just don't quite read it that way as I've gone through, but I know that Ben and some others have read it and said that's what it's all about. I'm not exactly sure of that, but that, that's not the main point I want you to carry out of verse 18 and 19. But I want you to, to, to really notice is verse 19 where he begins to talk about the fact that God has done something, something amazing. And he describes it how. What are some things said about what God has done? What are some superlatives that are being used here? Exceeding greatness. Exceeding greatness or immeasurable greatness, the way the English Standard Version says. There's something great God has done. What else is, is kind of a superlative here about? Great might. You know, this is, this is a sign. It's a working of. What, whatever this thing is that God has done, it is a demonstration of how mighty he is. How immeasurably great God is. And what I would su suggest to you in Ephesians, what he's talking about that is so great that God has done, is that he saved people. And they are the church. And the church, this group of saved people, that the ability to save men and women from their sins is a statement of God's greatness. And in fact, if you look at th this passage in verse uh, 3, chapter 3, 10 and 11, it's a statement to whom, even? <laughs> Not just to the world, obviously, but to whom? Heavenly places. Into the heavenly places. It's like the rulers and authorities that, you know, the beings beyond uh, this world, 
they know about the church. The church stands for because you see this? Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. Let me suggest to you that this, this first statement here through the church is not the idea that the church is out teaching the heavenly authorities. And stuff. We're not doing that. Now, if you said through the church, the lost may come to know about God, that's one thing, because we might be able to do that as part of that outward purpose. Now, now what it's saying here is, is that the existence of the church, it, its reality, that God has been able to do this, stands forth as a statement to the world and to even the heavenly places. God is great. He is mighty. Um, and so the question that would kind of rise is, you know, how well are we accomplishing that purpose? How well are we really uh, doing this? And I might even ask you even, how could we accomplish that purpose? Uh, just to be sure that we understand this, because I, I may get things out of order here. Go back up in chapter 3. you got Ephesians open. Go back up to, chap- to verse 3 of chapter 3, because I want you to understand what is so unique about the church that it would make such a statement like this. And it's not, by the way, just that God saved people from their sin. There's something else at work here, too, that's important. You go back to verse 3. Um, it leads into this thought that there's a mystery. And what's a mystery? Something unknown. Something unknown. How is the word mystery almost always used in the New Testament? And you'll see it's used this way here, for sure. It's, uh, it's something that's... Un- Unknown, but what? But God's made it known. It's like there's no point talking about mysteries that are still unknown. It's usually done in the context of, hey, this is something you could not know on your own, but God has made it known. That's what Paul is talking about. He's saying in verses 3 through 5, look, you couldn't know this, but God revealed it to me. Some things that we wouldn't have known, and so I received... By revelation, he says in verse 3, as I've written briefly, when you read it, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of God, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed by his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Okay, this is great, Paul. He's saying, I, I have this knowledge of this mystery. I'm making it known to you. My thought is, okay, well, what is it? What, what is the mystery? What's been revealed? He says in verse 6. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And he goes on to talk about how he was then told to go forth and preach the gospel to those Gentiles. Here's the point. One of the ways in which the church stands forth as a message to the world of the greatness of God is because now everybody, everywhere, every person is to be brought into the same one body. There's no longer a division of things like Gentiles and Jews and other ways about it. The church is meant to be one. Everybody of all kinds. And that is a statement, I think, even today in the world, which can be a very powerful one. So the question is, you know, are we accomplishing that purpose? Something to kind of keep in mind. Let's move forward. So, if we are to glorify God, here's one way we can do it. Somebody comes, it's a picture this morning, somebody's going to come, it happens every Sunday, right? Somebody's going to come to this church, perhaps for the very first time. And uh, they may not come to the Bible class period, so they may be coming into those back doors and walking in. What do you think they ought to observe here? Give me an ideal state. What are some things you would like to be true? It may not be true of this church. You don't have to pick something you think is true of embryos, but what do you think ideally they should be able to observe? The Lord's Supper. Okay, so why why the Lord's Supper? Why did you say that? That's good. I said that because, like, it's, I think personally today we should partake every, every first day of the week and take it seriously, not just push it off like some, like some other churches okay. do. So, you're focused on some of the acts and things that they will see, right? And and, and we're going to talk about that in this list a little bit. I want to be sure that that there's more that we talk about than just some uh, expectations of certain acts. 
But the reason why we do that should be connected with exactly what you just said. That, that we have a reason and a purpose behind that. We'll come back to that one. And if I walk in, there's a sign, a note, a label on the building that says a church of Christ. So I would expect to see perhaps some uh, focus on God and on Christ. All right. So there should be some something here that says these people are focused on God and Christ. People should look happy, happy to be there. Ah, so there should be some sense of uh, involvement and, and satisfaction. Katie, then Clifford, and back to Scott. Well, I mean, to the point of what the mystery that you were just talking about, we should be a pretty diverse, we are in a very diverse place, so we should be a good representation of where we are. We're in a diverse city. Should there not be some element of, of diversity uh, here, you would expect that, uh, perhaps, as you kind of read through those things. Clifford, you had a comment? Yes. They should see unity as well as that is orderly. Yes. So here's the thing. We're going to come back. I'm going to put those back on the list, both of those. There should be a sense of unity here. Someone mentioned being, there, there's a sense of being happy to be here. I think that's how, we ought to be glad to be with each other, especially if we thought about that inward purpose. If we're really doing all those things we talked about in those lessons, shouldn't they see that? Don't you think that's something you kind of observe? If people are glad to be together, they're getting along, there's a unity. There's a certain order that Clifford mentioned, too. We'll come back to that. Oh, that's my point, like, no dissension. dissension. Okay. Yeah, there's a lack of that kind of dissension. You ever been somewhere you felt like people you could just feel the tension in the air? I would also note that specifically for um, visitors, I have been places where everything has been fine except for the fact that nobody's talking to me. All right, so there should be some openness, some friendly, welcome. If you're a visitor, you should observe uh, that this place is welcoming you there. And then, Steve, I'm going to start to put some of these things up here. Yeah, that sense of welcome. All right, here's some. And again, if you're on page 39, um, I hope that you will begin to see uh, that we've tried to connect these all of these things we're going to list here with some passages. I think it would be good if they saw the entire church coming together. Now, are they clearly going to know what the entire church is? Have you ever gone somewhere and you knew ahead of time whether well, it should be about 150 people here <laughs> instead of 200 people? You don't know, right? Um, but what if they came in and they visited with us for several weeks and they began to notice this very disrupted kind of thing? Sometimes there's a lot of people here, sometimes there's never anybody here. There just wasn't the sense of the whole church wanting to come together. First um, Corinthians chapter 11, which will come back later, it's about the Lord's Supper. But he talks about the church coming together to do that. But First Corinthians 14 is a great passage for us to be talking about this upward purpose. And we're going to come back to it several times in, in this lesson and next time too. Because it is a chapter about how worship should be done. And in that uh, chapter, it talks about when the whole church comes together. There are times when the whole church should be coming together. And that just never happens. I think that would be a sign of something. If I visited long enough to know that there are 400 members here and there are never more than 220, do you think that, do you think that is a message? And that Maybe these people don't really care. Maybe they really don't want to be. Part of this, I think it's important uh, for the church to come together as a whole, and that to be something that we want uh, to do. Here's another thing: acts centered on God. I think that was you mentioned one, Haley, uh, an act that's centered on God. Barry talked about the fact that if, if we're bearing the name of belonging to Christ, then somehow there should be focus on God. Look at Hebrews 12, verse 28. Um. I'll come back and talk about John 4 in just a moment. But Hebrews 12, 28 is, is, I don't know, it's almost kind of a frightening passage to me, just the tone and the way that it puts it. But it, I think it's intended to draw our attention to when we are worshiping, who are we worshiping? Well, what it says here is, Therefore let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Do you think it's important for people to come in and, and get a sense among this group that we really respect and honor God? We have a sense of who He is, and, and, and therefore our acts, the things that we're doing, are really meant to be focused on God. 
the Lord's Supper, the, the manner in which we conduct ourselves in that, uh, the, the, the singing, uh, what people, the men who lead prayers, the way they, they say, the things they say about God, about, does that send a message? And, and I think that that's important that they can come in and see that. And then you got John 4, where Jesus talked to that woman at the well, and he was kind of pointing to this future time that we're now living in. And he said, you know, it doesn't really matter where you worship, but what does matter is that you worship in spirit and in truth. And I'm going to come back to the idea of, of spirit in a moment. But what he said in that was that they would worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So the focus is on God. And that's why we came together this, this morning for worship. A lot of other benefits we'll get out of it, but surely a visitor would say, hey, this is a group of people who actually care about God. It matters. Why would there be attention to God's Word, though? Why are we going to do that? I thought the focus is on God, so why are we going to put attention to, to the Bible, to the Scriptures and things like that? Why? Should we? We should. Okay, well, Haley's into it. <laughs> Why? We have no idea what we're doing. Okay, I think that's right. Um, and we're connected to some things we've said earlier in class, or our study. That's good. We don't we know, Steve. We, we then, know that everybody can understand the Word of God. And even when people come to visit, they may or may not have a certain level of, of experience with God's Word. But what level they do, they want to get a sense of whether it seems to be following God's word or not. And that would be obvious. Okay, so that would, would matter to, to some who have a knowledge of it and care about it. And that The fact that there's focus there. That's a statement to right. some who already have some knowledge. But then you see the hypocrisy too, because if there is. Because they might have heard, oh, the Church of Christ believes this, right. this, and this. And they get there and they don't see that or there's not unity or something, those kind of things. You know, if they can't pinpoint it, 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 just, it, it just makes them uncomfortable. Okay. That may be true for some visitors. That would be true for everybody, because some would have almost no knowledge of the word, but that would be true for some, for sure. A focus on pleasing God. Yeah. And not just simply looking to what pleases us at the moment, relying on Him and trusting that His, his word and guides us, and regardless of what we might think, ultimately, we turn to those Really, a number of good thoughts in that. So, we've tried to say that um, one of our goals here is to please God. We've also tried to talk about the scriptures about how is it that Christ leads a church. Remember that lesson? I think it was lesson four or five. I can't remember which one. We talked about how is Christ going to guide a church? If this is his church and he's leading us, how does he do it? Again, you can go back and, and agree or disagree, but review that lesson and think it through. We've tried to make the, the contention that he guides us through his word. That's how Christ is the leader. And if we come together and we bear that name outside and it says we belong to Christ, and then you walk in and here's the way he's going to guide us, his word, and we don't talk about it, we don't look at it, we're not driven by it at all, seems to me we're, we're, we're making a false statement. We say we're following Christ, here's his God, and we ignore it. It's kind of hard to really make the statement that we're really, truly following him. I think that's why there's attention to God's word. Not because the word is particularly special, but it's like listening to God. It's, this is a demonstration of us actually caring enough to listen uh, to God. Here's another thing. The worshipers would be full of the Spirit. Um, look over at, uh, do, do this for me, because I should have been some of the last one though. Look at Colossians 3 and go to Ephesians 5. Let's, let's try to like, put these two things side by side. I'm going to show you something I think is important. Um, I'm looking around verse 16 of Colossians 3 and around verses 18 and 19 of Ephesians 5. I'd like to first of all kind of establish for you that we are in the context of us all being together here. So verse 16, if you're in Colossians 3, talks about um, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another. You see that one another kind of aspect that we are there? Uh, and then you go over to chapter 5 of Ephesians, and we're up in verse 18. Uh, well, let's get to verse 19. Addressing one another 
in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You see, here is the context of us all. We're all together. We're singing. We're singing to God. We're also singing and teaching one another. I think the context is worship. It's an occasion like what we are here today. The Ephesians 3 one said, says this, by the way, in verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. It's another reason for that attention to God's word, which puts heaven dwelling in us. Ephesians 5 puts it this way. Uh, verse, back up to verse 19. Um, no, I'm sorry, back to verse 18. Leading into it. Do not get drunk with wine, that's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody to the Lord with your heart, and giving thanks always. Uh, let me tell you what I think that means. I, you may or may not agree with this. What I don't think that it means is the idea that we come in and the Spirit is just kind of taken over some portion of our faculties and and it's kind of driving us in some powerful inward force that's beyond our control. I don't, think, I don't think the scriptures talk about the Spirit doing that. But I think it is a little bit more than just simply saying that we know a lot about the Word. I think the idea is this, is, and I think it's connected back to John 4, that the true worshipers will worship God in spirit and in truth. I think when we come here, we should just be filled to the brim with the things of God, the things about God. Have you ever found yourself coming to a worship service where you were so distracted, the week had been really bad, everything's hard, you got a million things on your mind, and you, you, it's almost like you don't even remember driving here, and you just kind of showed up, and there you are sitting in your pew, and then worship starts. And how much did you get out of that service? I mean, you might have gotten a lot later, but you, how prepared really were you for it? There are other times, though, where your mind has been on God for different reasons through the week. You're really thankful for all the blessings that he's provided you with. There's a sense of the forgiveness that you've gotten from God. You remember all the great things Christ had to do to be able for us to be saved. You've spent some time in the Word and thought and in, in meditation and in prayer. And you come here already filled with the things of God, full of the Spirit. Is your worship experience different on that day than the other one? I, I, I think it is. Do you think that people can tell if a group... It's just kind of showing up. You know, it's the check, next check off the list this week. Okay, oh, my count, oh, 10 o'clock, Sunday morning. Yeah. And, and I'm there, sure enough, reliably. But I'm not filled with the Spirit. Do you think they can tell the difference between a group that's filled with the Spirit and one that's not? I'm convinced they can. And that's, we want them to see us as being full of the Spirit. There's order. Uh, look in, I told you 1 Corinthians 14 is the past talks about worship. And sure enough, it's like, uh, isn't it the last verse of 1 yeah, Corinthians last 14? Verse. Uh, like verse 40 or so, whatever that last verse is. It just simply says, let all things be done. It doesn't just say orderly. What's the other thing it says? Decent, properly. Yeah, and fortunately, fortunately for us, God sent us another manual. We don't know about it, but it defines exactly what decent and in order is. <laughs> It's a concept, but there's an expectation that what we what we do, there, there's a sense of decency and, and, and order to it. And by the way, in the context of 1 Corinthians 14, I think there's two reasons why you have that. One is verse 26 says, all things should be done for edifying. Um, so whatever it is, you know, sometimes you have chaos and, and disorder and stuff, it's very hard to be built up. Oh, and by the way, being built up, being edified, is which one of the purposes of the church? It's that inward purpose. Did you know that all worship should accomplish the inward purpose of the church, even though we're saying that it's focused on God, which it is, but it's doing, but you see how these things kind of, as, as Katie says, like a spiral, you keep coming through each one. You can't disconnect these things. They're together. What I don't, what I'm confident of, let me say it very firmly, it's not saying there is a rigid order that you never uh, go off of. You know, there, there's a formula, and you're going to do it exactly the same. You know, we're going to start at, at 
10.02, we're going to do this, and at 10.05, we will do this, and then we'll be, we will always have two songs, and then it will be exactly the same every single time that we come. Or some groups have what's called a Christian calendar, which means they can tell you two years from now what the reading will be on Sunday, April the 14th, if that is a Sunday or whatever, because that has been planned out from generations before, the exact order of those things. The reason why I know that it's not that is because 1 Corinthians 14 talks about a variety of activities that would be done and seemingly kind of putting it together maybe even within the context of a given worship period. But it is orderly, whatever it is, and it's decent, and we need to at least think through and, and, and use our judgment to make sure that it's that. If a visitor does... Oh, by the way, the other reason besides that it would edify is because visitors come among us and when they see disorder, it's like that makes a bad statement. That's what the passage says. So we want to be sure that there's a certain sense of order. Y'all talked about this. Look at James chapter 2. You're welcome to everybody. It's important that we have this kind of welcome. What's the context of James 2? Or what's the circumstance? What's happening there? Yes. Yeah, the partiality here is defined by, by wealth. You know, somebody comes in. And I also would say the partiality is based on outward appearances, right? When a person's dressed really well, looks to be rich, well, they get a welcome. They don't like them here. Right? And the other person shabbily dressed is pushed back in the back. It's very dangerous when we do it. And, 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 and we should always make a sense of welcome to anybody, regardless of what they're wearing. But... Can't you take this beyond just what people wear? Isn't there another way of thinking of it too? The race. The race. Uh, you know, maybe their ability to speak English as well. You know, all kinds of different things that might at first seem to be um, something that that might make them stand out. And so, well, well, but everyone's welcome. There should be no partiality, no distinction made about that. And it's a very important thing that there's a welcome to all. And James greatly criticizes them over the idea that they would show some kind of partiality. And I think a visitor ought to be able to come in and, and to see that. But also this. I think they ought to see a diversity in believers. And I understand that there are, there are plenty of churches in, in places and in neighborhoods that don't have diversity to begin with. And their membership is reflective, perhaps, of the city and location and, and even the neighborhood that, that they're in. And, and I'm not trying to be critical of that. I think in, instead, what we ought to do is, is flip that on its head and forget about that and take a focus at Ember Hills. There is diversity here. But is it genuine? Is it just because we all happen... To, to live in a city, and so we have a lot of different races and ethnic groups and, and uh, diversity in terms of new believers and those that have been Christians for a long period of time and all the other ways, economically, all the other things we can think about in this diversity. The, the, I think this puts a great responsibility on us. A visitor will walk in and see the diversity. That, that you can see. What else should they see behind it? Unity. Um, in love. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and put these up since those things are, are there. You, you've got to see that the fact that it's more than just the fact that we look different, but we are one. That there has been that building together. We're never going to be perfect in that. We should be working at it all the time. The other thing I'm convinced about it is, is that it lays a huge responsibility because it's an opportunity. Imagine if, if you were in a church that was all white and you tried to, uh, to, to, to bring your uh, friend who's, who's an African-American and they walk in, how welcome will they feel the day they walk into that church? Now, it could be a great welcome. Everybody's you know, friendly the way they're supposed to be. I don't know. You know it, sometimes that may feel not, not that comfortable. It doesn't have to be the case here, but doesn't that say that we are even more accountable to spread the gospel to everyone and make the welcome and for it to be genuine and true? It's essential that this be reality and not just superficial 
things that we sort of see. And it goes back to that message to the world. In this day and in, in age in which we are, the, our country is, man, we are so much at each other's throat about everything. We almost just cannot have a conversation about things. Everybody wants to go into a different camp, jump down somebody else. We're to be the opposite of that and have this demonstration of love and unity and peace here. And if a visitor will stay long enough, they should see that and it should be real. And it would make a huge way of glorifying God. All right, I'm sorry, I kind of rushed through. Those are important thoughts for us to consider as, as we go. On Wednesday, we'll try to look at some of those acts of worship, beginning with the Lord's Supper and some others as well. Thank you. Thank you.